It's a fascinating case. Unfortunately, it's also getting increasingly harder to discuss with my colleagues. The government is shutting down my lab and confiscating all my work just to be safe. I'm posting everything that I can remember while it is fresh in my mind. Otherwise, the details will eventually be lost to time and space. At least that's the best case scenario. God help us all if the government actually plans on using the information that they've gained. Either way, the nightmares may have started with a young woman named Bella Tomlinson. Her medical history showed that she suffered from disturbing nightmares at least as early as age 6. So, I know they weren't quite as bad as the rest of the towns would get. Seeing as how those could drive everybody to insanity or suicide within a few weeks. But Bella lived with them for 10 years before she was brutally murdered at age 16. When my team arrived to investigate, Rockfall, Kentucky had already been quarantined for a week. They had only been brought in with the FBI after the regular police and CDC failed to make much headway. The locals had the hypothesis that Bella was haunting them all from beyond the grave, and that the nightmares would only stop once her killer was found. The CDC initially suspected something more mundane was infecting the town folk, especially when the first responders started to have their own nightmares. However, tests showed nothing unusual in the water, the food, or the air and simply removing a resident from Rockfall ended their nightmares. Unfortunately, concerns about a contagious cause kept us from realizing that for a lethally long time. The town used to have a population of 5,120. About 300 had committed suicide by the time that we got there. Another 40 had died of heart attacks, and about 40 more had been murdered by their friends and family. We enacted policies, like curfews, that slowed the rate of destruction but only 3,000 survived long enough before we realized that we can simply move them to hospitals in nearby towns. Once a mile or so from Rockfall's borders, the patients would immediately feel better. Their first sleep afterwards was usually dreamless, before more normal patterns would resume. To protect ourselves, we investigators took medication that suppressed the need for sleep. Unfortunately, our bodies gradually built up the resistance to the pills, so we needed to work as quickly as we could. The last thing we needed was risking insanity ourselves. And then there were the ritualistic murders. Bella was the first, but nine others had followed. The killings were spread out over the town with none of the victims having anything in common. The M.O. was identical though. So much so that the police were 100% certain that it was just one serial killer. Aaron Bradley was the first to confess. He was Bella's boyfriend and the cops took him at his word at first. But he had been locked up for three days when the next murder occurred. Many others would also confess, but all would be ruled out for various reasons, such as solid alibis. It was an interesting mystery, but that's for the FBI now. I was only there for the dreams. When I was being recruited, I heard of a man who had been dreaming about being lost in the jungle. Everywhere that he turned, another dangerous creature would start to chase him. Another person dreamed of endlessly regurgitating razor blades. Another found herself as a child again and lost in the mall, amidst a sea of faceless, uncaring adults. These weren't unusual nightmares, at least not for their subject material. However, everyone complained of how realistic the dreams felt, how painful, and how endless. The man in the jungle felt himself torn apart by monkeys, jaguars, birds, 
and even animals not normally seen in the jungle like lions. But every time he died, he just appeared in another part of the jungle, and the chase would start up again. To him and others, they felt every second of every hour they were asleep. Some even experienced days and weeks passing. No one seemed to be able to wake from these horrible dreams by themselves. Instead, alarms or another person would need to wake them up. Otherwise, they would remain tormented in a kind of coma. Even more worrisome, the dreams seemed to swap around. For example, multiple people reported the jungle dream but never on the same night. They all described it precisely the same way. Even the order that the new animals were introduced was the same. The town first declared an emergency after a teacher fell asleep in his classroom. The nightmares had gone on for a few days at this point, but everybody assumed they'd pass without much harm. This teacher had decided not to go to sleep the night before, and this led to him accidentally taking a nap in class, and his students filmed him with their phones right before waking him up for a prank. Thankfully, the principal had the sound mind to confiscate all the phones soon after the incident, both to limit the public panic and because I got to watch what happened from multiple angles. After the kids prodded him, the teacher just screamed at first. It was almost like he had forgotten to open his eyes as he began to flail around with all his limbs. His coordination was completely off and it was like each limb had its own mind. Eventually, his eyes opened but looking around the room just seemed to cause him pain. His screams intensified, especially as his searching hands finally found his face and began to claw away. He would die of a heart attack later, but not before managing to pull out both eyes and skin most of his face. What kind of nightmare could do that to a man? What could he possibly have been dreaming about? I still wish that I could have seen it to myself even knowing what it did to that poor man. After witnessing that, I was determined to get to the bottom of this mystery. What exactly was causing the nightmares? How could the victims share their dreams? And why was there a clear geographic boundary to the dreams? I had plenty of subjects to interview, but the most interesting ones were the Sleeping Beauties so-called because they had been put into a medically induced coma. For some strange reason, they were unable to leave the town. They would react with increasing pain the closer they got to the Rockfalls borders. There were 12 of them, but two actually died of sudden multiple organ failure once they were moved too far. So it was easier to put the rest into a dreamless sleep and keep them in place. Not coincidentally, they were also the prime suspects for the serial killer. They were the only ones alive but unaccounted for when the last murder had happened. And so, a research lab was built in the center of town. We woke them up one by one to interview them and to try and intercept what they remembered of their nightmares. Unlike the others, they had the same nightmare every time. Their words haunt me to this day, but I will try to record them for posterity. However, I'll take a break for now. My health isn't what it used to be and I find myself quite tired now. When I feel up to it, I'll record the nightmares of David Chambers, the wedding photographer. It's definitely not for the faint of heart, but he had crucial information to share about the rest of the town. Until then, above all else, stay safe. Very respectfully, Dr. William Abbott. To clear a few things up, I'm back in my old hometown and I have no nightmares when I sleep in my own bed. The events that I am describing happened in the recent past. 
I only have what notes I could hide from the FBI, as references, but my memory has always been very good. Now I will describe the first interview I had with one of the ten sleeping beauties of Rockfall. David Chambers lived in that small town his entire life. Before the nightmares, he made a modest living as a photographer. He was the only choice for weddings performed in Rockfall, but it was legitimately due to his skill and not because there were no other options. If I were interviewing a regular patient, I would not have been surprised to hear that he had had a recurring nightmare where he was photographing weddings. However, David was the first person I had met in Rockfall who had nightmares that accurately reflected their waking life. When I first met David, he was already in the medically induced coma. I had read quite a lot about him and his dreams from the initial reports made by the FBI. But I pushed all of that knowledge out of my mind while more medication was applied to wake David for our interview. Unfortunately, the process allows a brief window where David starts to dream again before waking. And so David woke up dry heaving in between panicked yells. I allowed him to calm down before I asked him the generic interview questions to establish his competency. He actually recovered quite quickly. Probably because he was the type to be reassured by surrounding medical equipment. I think he thought that we knew what we were doing. Once he was calm, I asked him about his nightmare, and as far as I could remember, here is what he said. It always starts the same. I'm at the back of a barn that's been set up for a rustic wedding. Thirty guests are there and I'm doing my best to capture all the important moments, while being invisible to everyone else. While I'm snapping pictures, my mouth starts to ache. The pain gets so bad, I have to keep my mouth open. And so there I am, slack-jawed, looking like an idiot. And that's when the father of the bride turns around and looks right at me. I close my mouth really quick, but something's wrong and I feel a tooth break. The bride's dad turns around, so I try to stay professional and just keep taking pictures while sidestepping over to the wall. They have these large potted ivory soaks that keep a space between the wall and each bench. And so I creep over to one of those and I hide behind its leaves. While I'm still watching the beautiful bride say her vows, I try to, you know, nonchalantly spit out my tooth. But as soon as I open my mouth, it's like a faucet of blood opened. It just keeps pouring out of my mouth. I panic and several of the guests turn around then and start watching me. And so I close my mouth and just keep snapping photos as blood and bits of bone leak out from my lips. Every chance that I get, I try to spit out more in the other plants, my handkerchief, and the one trash can at the very back of the room. But my mouth just keeps leaking. I'm freaking out about the dental bill that will be coming. I'm freaking out about the review the bride will leave, and I'm freaking out about just how much blood I'm losing. Though when I spill too much blood on the floor or make too much of a scene, the whole crowd gets angry and swarms me. They literally tear me to pieces only for me to wake up at the start of the dream again, before my tooth broke. The rest of the dream continues the same until I'm finally able to keep things under control. And then the bride's daddy walks back to me and asks that I get in close for the final part of the ceremony. I keep my mouth closed so tight that the rest of my teeth start to hurt. But then I feel my mouth starting to get full of blood and bone while the minister is talking. Right then, he asks if anybody has any objections, and I can't hold it anymore. Everything just spews out and all over the bride's white dress. There's an impossible amount. With the bone alone, you couldn't have gotten so much even if you had shattered my whole jaw. Anyway, 
The whole place erupts and gasps and shouts. Everybody's mad. I just want to crawl away and hide somewhere, but then the bride gets right into my face and starts crying about how I ruined everything. Keep in mind, I'm still having blood and spit and stuff flooding out of my mouth. And so I shut it again, but I feel that pressure build up again immediately. My mouth is full, but I can't unleash on her again, so I just hold it. But she goes on and on. She starts to list my every flaw, my failures, and just won't stop crying. And so I swallow what's in my mouth. But once I start, I can't stop. I end up gulping down all that blood and bone. It's sharp and it hurts and it's just unbearable. And that's it. That's how it carries on until somebody wakes me up. What follows are my questions and David's answers. Everyone else in the dream, were they recognizable as people you know in real life? I noted that David blushed before answering. Yes, it was actually a recreation of my best friend's wedding. The first one that I had worked. Everyone who was there then was in my dream. How long ago was that? Gosh, some 15 years ago. And your best friend's name? Jeff. Jeff Tomlinson. Bella's father? And that would make the bride Mary Tomlinson. That's right, but she was Mary all way back then. Her dad was the mayor of the town briefly. Ironically, he's the one that came up with the idea to build the cabins for the homeless on the outskirts. Ironic. Yeah, Bella was definitely killed by one of those homeless weirdos. No one from our town would, could ever do something like that. Not to one of our own. I see, and the cabins are free for anybody to use. Yeah, that's the idea. And they're maintained by volunteers in each cabin as a security camera to enforce the rules, but I hear the cameras are just for show. They don't work. Either way, what rules would they be enforcing? Uh, no drugs, no sex. Nothing you wouldn't do in public, basically. They're small, just a bed with a roof and walls around it, really. So, of course, they're a popular place for the teenagers, who figured out that those cameras aren't hooked up to anything. Would Bella Tomlinson have gone there? Oh, not her. No way. She was as straight as an arrow. A good kid. A great kid. I see. What was your relationship with Bella like? No relationship, I mean. She's just a kid was just a kid. We didn't exactly run in the same circles, you know. I was friends, am friends, with her parents, but after Bella was born, there weren't a lot of opportunities to hang out anymore. So yeah. Mr. Chambers, no offense, but I have to ask everyone. Did you kill Bella Tomlinson? I noted that David hesitated for a full second before answering. No, of course not. I had never anyways, but I was out of town during the, uh, incident. Of course. I read the police report and they were able to find several witnesses to corroborate that you were visiting your mother in Eastern State Hospital. But like I said, I had to ask. Getting back to the nightmare. Were there any issues with the real wedding? None. I didn't break a tooth and everybody was very happy with my photography. Are all of your dreams the exact same? Yeah, even though I know what's coming up, I just can't stop myself. Like I'm doing a dance or something. Well, Mr. Chambers, I have some theories as to the meaning behind your dreams. But I want to do a little more research. In the meantime, you have to stay awake. The other researchers are going to run you through some tests and can provide movies and games after. 
and then I want to have another session with you before giving you medication that should help you achieve a lucid state in your dream. There are some things that I want you to do so your next dream can end prematurely, and hopefully permanently. I left David with my associates and traveled to his home with my FBI escort. Agent Miller used David's confiscated keys to allow me access. I found a great number of things to support my hypothesis that David's dream was being influenced by personal trauma. However, I had no idea why his dream would be so painfully real to him. But I thought I found a clue with how close he lived to the Tomlinsons. I could see their home just down the road. It was partially obscured by the Tomlinsons, Syringa Reticulica, and their front yard, also known as Ivory Silk. I asked Agent Miller to take me where to where Bella's body was found. It wasn't a long drive, just a mile from David's home. Bella was found right next to a seemingly random section of road. The body was long since removed, but the blue spray paint was still there. The killer had made some kind of magic circle with two triangles enclosed and meeting at a point. It looked like a crude hourglass on its side, with arcane symbols written above and below. None of the investigators recognized it, but thick lines of pain made it impossible to read the individual symbols. It definitely wasn't Wakan, or from any religion we were familiar with. Bella's body had been laid over the circle in a crucifix pose. Outside of the circle, over her head, the letters B-A-I-N were written, with the same blue spray paint. After seeing this, I was ready to help David. Back at the lab, I made sure David was absolutely comfortable in our observation room. I gave him instructions on how best to lose a dream, and then I had him take Gala to mine. While we waited for him to fall asleep, I asked him the following questions. Mr. Chambers, let us begin. Jeff Tomlinson is your best friend. Yep, had been since we were kids in grade school. We used to eat lunch together. And did you get along with Mary Tomlinson? Sure, everybody did. So there was never an incident where you made her cry or yell at you? No, not at all. I would kill myself if I managed to upset Mary like that. Mr. Chambers, it is quite common to have dreams where your teeth fall out. It's a universal fear of aging and poor health. But in your case, this degree of oral fixation and the social pressure you were put under to keep your mouth closed, well, I see this as a deliberate result of you having something to say. Something important that has been eating at you long before the nightmare started. Something so important that it is overriding the other nightmares you might otherwise be having. If you think you are having this specific nightmare because you now regret keeping silent during the wedding of your best friend, and your own romantic interest. It is clear enough from your own dream. I purposely kept from mentioning the photos and other souvenirs that I had found in his home. David looked sullen but never moved to interrupt me as I continued. You mentioned the bride and her father quite a bit, but you never really talk about the groom. I suspect that you were actually grinding your teeth in the beginning of the dream as we have observed you grinding your teeth in real life. As you spend a good deal of your dream being a voyeur watching the bride from a distance and even behind the ivory silk trees, not exactly a common wedding decoration. Throughout the dream, your jealousy grows but the need to appear professional keeps you in check, painfully so, until the minister reaches the point where he asks if anybody objects. You want to so badly that you physically could not keep your mouth closed anymore. But Mary's reaction, along with the rest of the crowd, does not go well. This is probably your expectation of what would happen in real life, though it seems exaggerated. Like you are punishing yourself for thinking such things. David started to cry. 
I stopped speaking for a bit, and eventually, he confessed between sobs. You're right. You are absolutely right. But it's not a new feeling. I knew 15 years ago that Mary was meant for me. I regret not saying no in the dream, but when I'm awake, I just regret letting her relationship with Mary and Jeff get so far in the first place. Mr. Chambers, I can get you together with a very good therapist when this is all over. But we have a more pressing problem that I think you will be in a unique position to help with. Your dream is more manageable than you think. And with my help, you're going to escape that nightmare, explore the outer limits of your dream, and most importantly, tell me what you see. And he did. We learned much more from David than any of the other patients because he was the first to break free of his nightmares. But my goodness, I had not intended to write so much that it had grown far later than I realized. I'll have to save the story of David's exploration for another time. I'm sorry, I know it's a very fascinating case, but I wasn't a young man when it started and I fear that it had aged me terribly so. I must rest. Until then, above all else, stay safe. Respectfully, Dr. William Abbott.